Hello everyone, it's Mrs. Wallace. How are you? I just wanted to do this uh, video for you about populism. Uh, this is the populist movement. It's in about 1880 and 1890. Um, it really culminates in um, an election of 1896. Uh, but this is um, very similar to the way that we looked at the issues that faced and plagued laborers in the time period of this um, Gilded Age, you know, when we have uh, large corporations, you know, monopolies, and a government that's very, very hands off. Um, we see, you know, workers kind of trying to appeal uh, for some of their demands, right? In the case of the workers, they wanted an eight hour day in order to seek this. They're unionizing, they're striking, you know, they're using certain tools to give themselves essentially more power in the society, you know, that isn't giving them any. Um, today in class, we also talked a little bit about the nature of the new immigrant and the way in which, you know, that's adding to some of this challenge of, you know, kind of access to power. And the farmers, to some degree, are also in this very specific space. They have unique issues because they're, you know, in agriculture. We're talking about um, farmers both in the West and in the South. Um, an extensive number of people, much more so than today, where we tend to see fewer uh, family farms, a lot more um, large-scale farming today. But one of the big changes in 1880s and 1890s, um, just like uh, the, um, the, the workers that face uh, industrialization, you know, farming changes completely because of industrialization. There's a great deal of mechanized um, you know, techniques to be able and mechanize equipment that um, will uh, help to grow food and it leads to massive productivity booms and decreases in prices. So farmers are going to have particular issues uh, that plague them and the populist party will be a focus on addressing those, okay? Um, one of the things that we might note is a little bit about uh, populism today. So just as an aside for a second, because we sometimes hear the word populism, we might also hear about a rise of populism for the last uh, few years, you know, really um, for some time now, maybe a decade or so, we've been hearing about a rise of populism. When you think about the word populism, sometimes this is a debated word, you know, exactly what it means. You know, it's a little bit um, interpretive. Some uh, scholars will say uh, populist leaders uh, really speak out for the common man. So that's something that, you know, populism tends to be about and where it gets its name from. Um, lots of uh, scholars would also attach the idea of a populist leader being anti-elite as something that might be a characteristic of a populist. Um, so in 2016, Bernie Sanders was running for the Democratic nomination uh, for the president. You know, he ended up um, not winning the Democratic nomination. Uh, Hillary Clinton did, uh, but he was advocating certain things like uh, free college, maybe greater access to uh, universal health care, you know, things uh, like that. Um, oftentimes is described as a progressive, uh, but some might describe him also as a um, left-leaning populist uh, because some of his rhetoric also included um, ways to penalize uh, large corporations and to try to almost like recalibrate, you know, the benefits that um, capitalism is giving to corporations versus like, you know, the average American or middle America. And so some of that may kind of employ a little bit of populist rhetoric. And of course, in 2016, um, the election winner was Donald Trump, uh, who's often been described as like a right wing populist, one of many who've like kind of risen in the last uh, few years in Europe, too. There's been a lot of populist leaders. Um, some historians have written that that could be uh, concerning because some of the right wing populism was like you know, kind of threatening uh, democracy to some degree. In this case, scholars say um, populism is not only being anti-elite and kind of advocating for the common man, because at the end of the day, lots of people do that, um, but it is um, this idea that only one leader and, you know, one leader alone can really save the common man and other forms of authority are um, either corrupt or illegitimate or, you know, ousted out of power or whatever. So um, that right wing populism has that sense of something maybe a little bit more um, leaning toward uh, authoritarianism, you know, and that's a, a debate amongst uh, historians. Uh, how much, you know, the older populist movement is like populism today, that's debated. You know, if we said like modern populist movements 
could potentially, if in the uh, case of um, some of the, um, you know, uh, European leaders, say the uh, European leader of Hungary, for example, um, or maybe uh, President Trump had been accused of becoming too uh, authoritarian or perhaps not relying enough on um, some uh, institutions and whatnot, maybe being a threat to democracy, you know, we can kind of ask the question of, is that the same in the turn of the century time period? Or is the pop, are the populists like seeking better rights? Are they expanding democracy, right? What, what kind of populism is this? Um, the uh, chart that we're looking at, we can use to just try to highlight some of the specific issues that farmers face. We're looking at um, price um, index for uh, consumer and for farm products. And if we can just get an idea for farm products, um, you know, we're looking at, you know, crops basically, right? Um, what are some of the issues? And if you just look at where the red is, so we can see the red between 1885 and, you know, 1908 or something like that. This is a time period where farmers have some really specific problems. One is uh, farmers are going to see very, very low prices, all that mechanization of agriculture, which is happening in the United States, but it's also happening across the world, is leading to uh, an oversupply of crops and also, um, you know, low prices. And so if you're a farmer, you know, you generally are getting uh, a price. It's almost like if you're studying economics, it's probably fairly close to a perfectly competitive um, market where farmers are pretty much price takers and they are accepting uh, a price that is going lower and lower and lower as a result largely of uh, technology. Um, farmers, of course, are um, devastated by these low prices because they're bringing in uh, lower revenue. At the same time, um, anyone in farming, and these at the time period in the late 1800s, a lot of smaller uh, independent farmers um, we're not really looking at large corporate farms at this point. So you're seeing a great deal of, um, uh, you know, issue with uh, debt. Um, a lot of the debt is coming uh, from uh, money that is borrowed and, um, or, you know, to, to either fund new equipment, seeds, all of the supplies that farmers need, and ideally borrowing money that would then get repaid from revenues. Now revenues are less and debt is um, higher and higher. And so um, debt is an issue and farmers are going to basically blame uh, people in finance, people in um, uh, banking, uh, people you know, in uh, groups that are loaning out some of the money. Another issue that the farmers have is the railroads. And you know, before we go any further, if you look at this red that's here, you're looking at all of these years and we can see it particularly significant in 1896, which happens to be an election year where farmers are paying uh, more for the purchases. Um, these might be purchases from overseas or there might be pur purchases, you know, locally, but farmers are paying a lot more for the goods that they need, you know, compared to what they're receiving in revenue, you know, for their actual product. So, you know, that's a problem uh, with farming. And then that debt just becomes, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, railroads are part of the reason why farming becomes more and more expensive. Um, there's high costs and farmers tend to feel that the railroads and the bankers are kind of in this together. Large corporate monopolies, bankers are kind of, you know, exploiting the farmers. And that's something that the farmers are going to be antagonistic about. OK, um, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, the other uh, things that we can look at is ways that the farmers did try to address some of these issues. You know, as early as the 1870s, uh, there were cooperative associations. So just be familiar with the Granger laws and the Grange movement. This is like the farmers attempt to be cooperative. In some cases, this is going to mean creating, um, you know, places where groups of farmers can buy goods in bulk, maybe share some equipment. Some of this is even social, like having, um, you know, barn dances that ultimately might benefit people in a community because farming is unique because people are very spread out. The problem that we saw in like urban communities with everybody having a, a density that they're on top of each other, um, that's not the case. You know, in agricultural communities, people are very spread out. It's kind of isolating. And so uh, that's an issue. And so lots and lots of the Grange movement is trying to 
you know, kind of put farmers together in a group. And this is something that starts as a movement. Um, it will be replaced by something known as farmers alliances, which start regionally and then start to merge. And this is a much more political um, movement. Uh, the Supreme Court decisions that are going to make this political movement um, really kind of activate from the Grange laws to something that is going to be more politically active. Uh, first is the Munn v. Illinois case. I think this was in the earlier Capital versus Labor video too. Uh, there's a case where basically it's okay for states to regulate the railroad. So it seems like um, some of the Grange uh, movement is going to have some impact and they're going to be able to, within certain states, have regulations over the railroad. Uh, by 1886, that's completely thrown out the window. It turns out that corporations are actually defined as persons. They're protected by the 14th Amendment. So states cannot regulate the railroads. Only the federal government can do that. And this is where we see um, Interstate uh, Commerce Commission, which is generally going to be very, very weak. Uh, and farmers are going to continue to be antagonistic toward uh, the railroad, which it sees, um, you know, kind of providing unfair prices, especially for short distances. And that's really what farmers wanted. Uh, we see farmers coming together, uh, a Northern Alliance, a Southern Alliance, and this is by 1889. It's really like a political uh, grouping and farmers are starting to talk about um, running some local candidates. And there's a, quite a few people who are significant in this movement. We don't have to really um, identify all of them. But around 1892, we get about 800 people, have this massive meeting in St. Louis, Missouri, and many of these folks are going to be talking about um, ways to reform and address you know, some of what is going on and affecting uh, farmers. Uh, some important takeaways at some of these um, alliance uh, meetings. Um, we will see uh, participation early on by Black Americans. So initially, this is inclusive. It won't arguably stay that way. Um, there'll always be uh, individuals within the movement with strains of racism. Uh, so that's always going to be an issue. But initially, there are quite a few um, efforts to make it inclusive. And there's also going to be a kind of a hodgepodge interest in um, group groups that don't necessarily have a lot in common with the farmers in terms of their exact, you know, issues with prices and weather and things that farmers uniquely experience. Um, we get other people who have uh, an interest in creating uh, uh, higher prices, for example, like the Greenback Party, a party from the time period of the Civil War that wanted to use um, increases in currency to kind of inflate um, change the value of currency to basically create inflation. Uh, there's other groups of people too. This is what we see um, is almost like a making fun of this meeting in the political cartoons, the platform of lunacy. Um, it's kind of a patchwork quilt of a whole bunch of groups that aren't being met by the Republican and the Democratic Party. Uh, the Farmers Alliances are in this group and then kind of connected with them. Sorry about that. You know, is included like the old Greenback Party, Communists, People's Parties, the Grangers, the Silver Party, Prohibitions in here, the Knights of Labor, all of these kind of, you know, oddball uh, parties, uh, but parties that have some demands that, you know, starting to have some common enemies. Uh, James Weaver is one of the first presidential uh, candidates that really um, fits into this movement that's like this populist party, a third party that is going to, you know, run candidates locally and then as well as presidents. Um, in 1892, the populists do not win the election, but um, James Weaver will acquire about a million popular votes and they actually win several congressional seats. So, you know, imagine if we had several uh, third party, you know, seats today. Uh, that's kind of a game changer. And it is significant because the populace um, are sizable enough that people start to listen to them. Uh, of all the things I note, the Omaha platform is probably the most significant. And you had a reading, um, a source that described the Omaha platform. This is basically a laundry list of the farmer's demands. And you had this in a longer um, description. Uh, I would go back to that because these are some key things. Uh, but let's just note some of the key parts of the 
um, farmers platform. And this is basically like their wish list. And it's kind of interesting because some of it seems obvious and things that actually do happen uh, at the time. None of these is the case. Um, system of sub treasuries. These sub treasuries are almost going to be like, you know, silos filled with grain that farmers can largely borrow against. So it's like a way of putting up a little bit of 